Well, welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Alan, recently you put some miles in across the U.S., specifically across the Corn Belt. When you look at crop conditions, what stood out to you? Well, it, along the interstates, at least, the crop looks better than I anticipated it would. It was more consistent. The corn corn is almost uniformly pollinating, although there is an area in Indiana that's, that's clearly behind. The, uh, you know, you can't tell from the road uh, if you lost kernel rows due to, due to early stress on the corn. Soybeans, is, in general, were a little shorter than uh, they might normally be at the end of July, but they, they had good canopy and good cover. And I only saw a couple of fields when it was 95 degrees on Wednesday that were that were showing some stress, looking a little gray, a little, little uh, turned over. Uh, now, having said that, I, I know there's areas off the interstate that are worse. I, I will uh, say I had several questions from producers back east about the smoke and the effect that that might have on the crop, whether they were concerned that the soybeans were get, weren't getting enough sunlight. Uh, but I also had uh, some other producers saying, well, yeah, but it kept it a little cooler for the corn up until recently. So uh, mixed bag there. But I, I would say, uh, you know, we're we're in the 174, 175 yield range on corn right now based on current conditions. And uh, the standard deviation would still allow 179 or 180 if, if we have a, a good finish to the corn crop. Soybeans somewhere over 50, uh, probably not 52. Uh, based on what we know today. We'll be doing our virtual corn tour the first week of August uh, where we ask our producers to send in yield results and, and get a, a very accurate read. Mm -hmm. But uh, that again, that's next week. Well, trying to get a grasp on really what crop production looks like here. Also, the demand picture. China coming in with a buy this week from the U.S. Is China continuing to be a big supplier to Brazil or, or is Brazil being a big supplier to China or why is China coming to the U.S., Dan? Well, you know, as you think of China, they were the big short in the soybean market following that uh, surprisingly bullish uh, June uh, seedings report uh, in late June. So the Chinese were hoping that weather would improve in the U.S., give them a break. It didn't happen. They ran against the calendar. They're now coming to the market in, in large stead in Brazil. They have bought out almost every metric ton available for the September loading period. You see almost 2 million tons of uh, Chinese corn now in the vessel counts in Brazil. So in both sides, I've now taken my Chinese uh, corn export as uh, Chinese, excuse me, soybean import estimate up to 104, 105. That's a record. So USDA still has to make some sizable adjustments. In terms of China and corn, we think in a year ahead, they'll take about 23 or 24 million tons. So both well up from last year, the Chinese see the opportunity in Brazil as, uh, as, as, as that, and they are buying it accordingly. I don't think they buy US until we get to October. That's when we're competitive in the world market for both soy and, and uh, less degree corn. But Dan, in the Panama Canal, we have seen there's been a reduction in, in, in ships and in the quantity that can, can go through the Panama Canal. Is that having any impact on export flow? Little, a little, a little, if you will. Of course, if you're loading out from Brazil, you go around the horn and you go the other way. And so China has really been taking advantage of that. I do expect with the improved weather down in Panama that the canal will fill a little better and we will see floats coming up. But in a general sense, it's just been the cheapness of Brazilian corn and soybeans that has allowed them to compete. Remembering again that Brazilian farmers have been aggressive sellers. They had a record crop. They needed to get rid of it. China was there to catch it. Well, Alan, as we saw the Fed raise rates this week, I mean, it was expected. It wasn't a surprise. Uh, but, you know, is, is that impacting any of our commodities? And what are you watching as the Fed continues to debate, debate more interest rate hikes yet this year? Well, where the rubber hits the road is does it does it affect the value of the U.S. dollar? We care about that more after harvest than we do during the growing season because yield variance makes bigger price swings than the value in the dollar changes do. But uh, what we're looking at here is uh, whether the Fed's actually getting inflation under control. It looks like the, the inflation for goods and also at the wholesale level, the PPI level, uh, has dropped off quite a bit. You know, from those perspectives, they could stop raising rates right now. Where, where the problem is, is in services. Uh, services are more labor dependent. We've got a little wage, wage cost spiral still going here. That's why the Fed raised rates. They're, they still need to slow that down a little bit. Uh, you know, employment is a rough gauge of that. 
But bottom line for the for the ag commodities is primarily does it affect the dollar. The dollar has dropped down. The index is about 100 to 101 right now. That's helpful to exports compared to where we were uh, six months ago, say. But uh, uh, again, we we think the Fed's close to to stopping the rate hike cycle. I don't I don't see them needing to ease uh, before the end of the year at the present time. Dan, there's plenty of things being talked about right now when it comes to markets and the impact on on, on prices, not only with livestock, but also grains. But as you look over the six months, the next six months, what do you think is one thing that maybe is not being talked about enough that farmers should be paying attention to? Oh, here's one for you. And that if you look at the Brazilian real, which has been appreciating rather dramatically over the last six months, a year ago, it was trading 5.5. Today, we're trading somewhere around 4.7. Brazilian farmers, due to the uh, currency, are not making as much. In fact, many of them are losing money. So as we survey Brazilian farmers, my office in Sao Paulo, we're finding that the expansion is not going to be as great as USDA and some folks uh, think about. That upcoming Brazilian soybean crop is going to be so important to the world with the U.S. shortfall that I believe that's something the market's really got to focus on going forward. All right. And Alan, what's, what's something you're thinking that is just not getting enough attention right now? Well, I, I think the uh, the yields are getting plenty of attention, obviously. Exports is, are still a concern. Uh, one thing I would remind folks of is short crop, long tail. There is a tendency for uh, when we have prices go to multi-year highs, and we were at 10-year highs uh, last summer. Uh, when we go to those multi-year highs, it tends to be a long tail uh, slide in prices because production expands, consumption gets curtailed, and prices generally work lower into uh, more of an equilibrium. So uh, <clears throat> we're, we're seeing a little of that in both corn and beans. It got interrupted with this with the Ukraine situation and, and the heat dryness issue here. Uh, the bulls got a little fuel for the time being, but our default mode is that o- over the next year or two, prices will drop back down. And, and producers need to be aware of that and, and making purchasing decisions and particularly the land decisions with that in mind. Yeah. Alan, Dan, thank you so much for joining us this weekend. We appreciate it. All right. We need to take a quick break and then we're headed outdoors on the farm with Chip Flory. That's next. <laughs> 